Holy fuck! Hey guys, Happy Easter! Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and today we'll be exploring the awesome Edge of Tomorrow, which is directed by Doug Lehman. Based on the celebrated Japanese manga, All You Need Is Kill, which itself was based on a Japanese light novel of the same name. The film stars Emily Blunt, the late Bill Paxton, Brendan Gleeson, and Tom Cruise as Major William Cage, a former marketing advisor turned soldier who, after dying in a battle with extraterrestrials, is caught in a time loop that makes him live the same day over and over again, allowing Cage to improve his fighting skills. The light novel, which was published in 2004 and written by Hiroshi Sakuruzaka, featuring illustrations from Yoshitoshi Abe, was a breakthrough success, earning praise from readers and writers across the globe. The story was then nominated for Best Japanese Novel at the Shion Awards before being turned into a Japanese manga exactly a decade later by Ryusuke Takeuchi and Takeshi Obata months before the film's release in May. I thought I should also point out that a separate American adaptation of the light novel was released around the same time as the movie, and really, aside from the addition of colour, I really didn't think this graphic novel was necessary. And if you want to expand your knowledge of the story further, I'd simply recommend reading the light novel or the manga as they're both pretty spectacular. Initially thought to have been too complex to properly adapt the film, the first draft was written by Dante Harper on behalf of his Productions, who eventually sold the story and rights to Warner Brothers in April of 2010, before Lyman was brought on board to direct a few months later. Brad Pitt was first to be sought out for the role of Bill Cage, and after he declined, Tom Cruise was approached, who gleefully embraced the prospect of putting his body on the line for our entertainment in December of the following year. Emily Blunt was also soon cast as Sergeant Rita Vratsky, Cage's mentor, and as the film headed deep into pre-production, Lyman discarded of most of the script and sought out screenwriters Christopher McQuarrie and brothers Jez Butterworth and John Henry Butterworth, who found this unique way of creating a balance between humour and horror, akin to the recurring violent demises of Wile E. Coyote, which is something that that both Lyman and Cruz push for. Now, the first few drafts were initially titled All You Need Is Kill, harking back to the source material. However, producers were concerned about the negativity associated with the word kill, leading Lyman to rename the project Live, Die, Repeat, which was eventually changed to Edge of Tomorrow, as this was thought to be more in line with what the film was actually about. Though Live, Die, Repeat was scrapped, the production company did end up using it as a slogan for the film, with the words emblazoned on the posters, along with the official title. Principal photography began at Leavesden Studios near London on October 1st, 2012, though the director had initially hoped to film the beach battle on location. The beach set, which felt reminiscent of World War II coastal battles such as the invasion of Normandy and the Battle of Dunkirk, was surrounded by chroma key green screens that the visual effects artists could use to extend the scale of the beach and the ensuing battle. However, when it came to the scenes featuring Trafalgar Square, they were all shot on location, requiring the entire area to be close to the public, much to the confusion and irritation of locals. Due to the complex nature of the fight scenes, which involved numerous troops kitted with battle suits that weighed between 40 to 110 pounds depending on the make and composition, the entire shoot ended up taking just over a year. It should also be noted that Lehman's hands-on approach to the cinematography, which utilised a lot of improvisation and reshoots, contributed to the lengthy production time. It also did not help that the weather was temperamental, and since most of the movie was a repeat of the same battle day in clear skies, when the weather turned on the crew, they were forced to change their shooting schedule and work on other aspects of the film. Veteran Australian cinematographer Dion Beebe, who'd worked on films like Equilibrium and Collateral, was hired to shoot the film and was instrumental in creating a near post-apocalyptic future where mankind was on the brink of destruction. When talking about his process on the film, Biebs explained that his approach was to develop a world under siege, but not a bleak, dark, post-apocalyptic landscape. And he achieved this by using 35mm film instead of digital cameras, which also helped to evoke the World War II footage style of filming, which served as inspiration for the battle scenes. A handful of different visual effects companies were also hired to work on the production under the direction of visual effects supervisor Nick Davis, with the third floor assisting him on the film's pre-visualisation process, Sony Pictures Imageworks working on the first two acts of the film, creating over 400 shots in total, including the battle scenes, computer-generated creatures and characters, as well as the photorealistic environments, along with companies like Rodeo FX, MPC, Cinesite Studios, Framestore and Prime Focus World. 
Though Sony worked on the bulk of the visual effects shot list, they'd specifically brought on rodeo effects to assist in working over the shot of London's Heathrow Airport, getting rid of the planes and usual traffic, while SBI's crew created the base at Heathrow by merging the set at Leavesden with digitally altered footage from the airport. With the creation of the aliens, the designers involved sought to make them look different from any terrestrial animal encountered by mankind, with both Lehman and Davis favouring early models that were composed primarily of tentacles. In order to make the movements of each tentacle look independent, a technical animator working with Sony Pictures Imageworks made an Autodesk Maya plugin to facilitate this specific function. And since the director didn't want the mimics to look too organic or terrestrial, the designers opted to make the aliens out of an obsidian glass-like material that could both cut and reconstitute itself into numerous shapes. The alpha mimics were also given a definable head area to show their status as more sentient, whilst also receiving a different colour and a larger frame compared to the grunts. Cinesite Studios were also recruited to create the mechanical training mimics, while the task of creating the Omega in a digital environment was appointed to MPC. Digital versions of the battlesuits were created by animators, with and without the soldiers inside them, and a 3D scanner booth was also utilised to digitise the actors, both of which were used to enhance the armour and facilitate the work of Prime Focus World, who converted the film into 3D in post-production, using the same tools of stereoscopy that were utilised in World War Z and Gravity. Though they may seem like a work of science fiction, the battlesuits worn by UDF soldiers were actually modelled around contemporary, real-world powered exoskeletons used in factories, and by soldiers and DARPA initiatives that aimed to remove the stress and workload of people that had to do repetitive movements that strained muscles and joints. Over 70 hard material and 50 soft battlesuits were crafted during pre-production, with three variants including the grunts, dogs and tanks which served as heavy artillery. The quadcopter dropships seen in the film were based on the Bell Boeing V-22 Offspray, which has the ability to tilt its rotors to fly as either planes or helicopters, while having a design closer to the quad tilt rotor. And aside from the crashed ship on the beachhead, and a gimbal set to depict the plane used by Cage's squad, the film used predominantly digital models for most of the ships. It should also be noted that the computer-generated dropships had some of Imageworks' heaviest detail given the proximity of the actors to the dropships, and I have to admit they did a bloody good job as the battle scenes are beautifully orchestrated glimpses into the horror and chaos of the front line. <laughs> Set in 2020, the film picks up five years after the arrival of an alien race called Mimics in Germany that proceed to decimate continental Europe. It's explained that the United Defence Force, which was essentially an amalgamation of every nation in the world led by the US and UK, was able to achieve one victory over the Mimics at Verdun, after a number of defeats that had demoralised the resistance, leading the UDF to plan another offensive on France in the hopes of reclaiming some territory and driving the aliens back. It's here that we're first introduced to Major William Cage, a member of the Media Relations Department of the military, who was used to recruit new troops into the UDF. Much to his surprise, the Major, who had no combat experience, is ordered by General Brigham to head into the front line and cover the assault on France. And when the self-centred Cage threatens to publicly blame the General in the likely event that the offensive results in failure, he is tasered, arrested, and has his records changed to show that he was only a private before being thrown into the Misfit J-Squad under the command of Master Sergeant Farrell. What day is it? For you? Judgment day. The good news is there's hope for you, Private. Hope in the form of glorious combat. Now, the invasion proves to be a massive failure for UDF, with the Mimics seemingly expecting the attack, and we see the entire squad killed in battle, before Cage himself used a Claymore mine to kill an unusually large blue Mimic whose blood dissolves onto the Major as he also died. Cage then wakes up to find himself back at the base, experiencing the events of the previous day over and over again. And though he attempts to warn Farrell and the others that the invasion would result in failure, no one seems to believe him. During one of these loops, Cage unsuccessfully attempts to save the life of Sergeant Rita Fratsky, who was a seasoned fighter that was in essence the face of the resistance who inspired the troops. Right before their deaths, Rita tells Cage to find her when he next wakes up, indicating that she knew exactly what was happening to him. When he does so, she explains that she used to have the same power as him before a blood transfusion removed the alien DNA from her body, and the Angel of Verdun begins training him to be a more effective fighter, making full use of the cursed advantage he now had of replaying the same battle over and over again. Rita also introduces Cage to Dr. Carter, a self-professed expert in mimic biology, who explains that the mimics were all a part of a single organism. We're told that the drones that fight on the front line were essentially the claws, while the rare alphas acted as a central nervous system for the brain, which housed the Omega, a unique organic device that gave the mimics a measure of control over time. 
We're also told that whenever an alpha died, a direct message is sent to the brain, causing it to trigger the omega, which in turn restarted the day. And since the superorganism could remember everything that happened before, this enabled it to wipe out the UDF through memory-infused perfect strategy. Since the Mage's first death causes DNA to fuse with that of the Alpha he destroyed, he'd essentially gained control over the Mimic's ability to reset time. The only problem was that as Cage and Rita didn't have the interconnectedness of the Mimic's that fought as a collective, both soldiers had to fight on their own, carrying the weight of the future on their shoulders. Though Rita and Cage are able to progress further and further into the battle, with every bit of information the Major is able to recollect from each experience, the process of seeing everyone continuously die around him begins to take its toll on Cage, who also begins forming an attachment to Rita. Unfortunately, during one of their attempts to secure a device originally created by Dr. Carter that would enable an Alpha to locate the Omega, they're both wounded and instead of dying, which would have reset the day, Cage is given a blood transfusion, which robs him of his power to relive the day, much like what had happened to Rita. Now, after receiving visions that indicated the location of the Omega beneath the Louvre, Cage is able to convince J-Squad to go against their orders in a mission to destroy the Omega, which they were able to successfully complete, though each of the soldiers, including both Rita and Cage, die in the process. Surprisingly, when the Major wakes up once again, he finds himself where he was at the beginning of the film. Only this time it's explained that all mimic activity had mysteriously ceased the night before, indicating that their mission was indeed successful. You know, the character I play, Cage, he's a marketing guy, a PR guy. I want you to sell the invasion. Okay. He's not a warrior in that way. He just wants to get out. He wants to survive. He wants to survive. It really comes down to survival. You just realize there's no way out. He's not going to get out of combat. Remember, there's no courage without fear. Edge of Tomorrow is an outstanding movie that still holds a critic and audience rating of 90% on Rotten Tomatoes, in part due to its combination of intelligence, intensity, and dark humor, as a modern day hybrid of films like Aliens, Starship Troopers, and Groundhog Day. For me, it was also refreshing to see Cruise play a reluctant hero, unlike all his other roles where he's usually cast as a confident protagonist that is more than capable from the start of the film. I mean, he begins this movie as a selfish coward and transforms into a hero through consequences and factors beyond his control, a unique story arc that isn't usually found in big Hollywood productions. The action scenes were also insane, especially the contrast between the inexperienced Cage and the fighter we get at the end who was seasoned by thousands, if not tens of thousands of battles. Shouldn't you be over there? I've been over there. More times than anybody. As a matter of fact, I'm usually long dead by now. A high-octane adrenaline ride filled with numerous surprises. Edge of Tomorrow is a must-watch for lovers of sci-fi action, and the film must be viewed on a big screen to take advantage of Lehman's directorial prowess. Well, that's all for today, folks. Big thanks to all of you guys who requested we take a closer look at Edge of Tomorrow. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. I'm sorry. I'm trying to save you. We're getting slaughtered. You need to get us off this beach. <laughs>